Welcome to the Focus Podcast. I'm singing Lisa. Today you will hear from three doctors sharing great and valuable information concerning the coronavirus and its effects on the community, our environment, and medically what treatments are becoming available and are being worked on as we speak. We are practicing social distancing and we are following the rules so that we can maintain all that is required of us to keep healthy and to keep everyone as healthy as possible. Possible, but I'm very honored to introduce to you Lee H. Matthews, PhD. He is a clinical neuropsychologist as well as a clinical psychologist with a background in uh, education with a BA from the University of Tampa as well as an MS from Trinity University of San Antonio, Texas. His PhD in clinical psychology came from University of Mississippi as well as his internship which was at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Postdoctoral Fellow in Neuropsychology at University of Nebraska Medical Center. Well, we are honored to have you here, Dr. Lee Matthews, and this is a very uh, serious time with a lot of information that people are looking to help them in some way. And of course, coming from the psychological aspect is uh, really touching everyone in a very unique way. So um, what advice do you give and what signs do we look for? Okay, well, what I want to do is I'm going to be talking primarily about the mental health and psychosocial issues and also provide a little bit of information to you about the kinds of things that are going on, what's happened, why we feel the way we do uh, today. So that's what I'm, I'm planning on uh, talking about a little bit. Um, first thing I guess is uh, we're all going through a lot of different emotions and in this situation um, I'm not going to talk about the diagnostic implications. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what those emotions are that people are likely to be experienced. Um, fear. Yes. <laughs> anxiety. Uh, depression. Grief. Grief's one you don't think about, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But uh, um, some of us might even say all of the above mm -hmm. <laughs> right now. So let's look at just those. Fear. Fear is a normal reaction to alert us to danger. Fear and panic are normal things when we think we're in threat. And perhaps the easiest way I can describe that is um, suppose you're um, about to cross the street and you step off a curb and a careless driver almost hits you. That's fear. What happens? All of those physical, emotional, uh, verbal <laughs> comments you may make to somebody. Um, that's what fear is. Um, anxiety is a little different. It's a little more complicated. Um, it's a blend of emotions and thoughts. They tend to be more oriented, anxiety tends to be more oriented like to the future um, and more diffuse than fear. It's a sort of generalized sense of apprehension or foreboding. Something, something could happen. I don't know what it is but something could happen. And it helps us in one way prepare for the future because it sort of motivates us to look around. Unfortunately, anxiety occurs in the absence of an identified danger or one like the current uh, uh, virus uh, when we don't know all of the details. And so that impacts us. Depression, the third one. Uh, depression's a mood disorder. Uh, feelings of sadness, feelings of loss, anger, uh, frustration uh, all come in and they interfere with our everyday life. Um, depression has no single kind of cause. It's due to a, a lot of different kinds of factors. Um, family and genetics plays a role. Trauma or stress. Well, we certainly have enough of the latter going on now with us. Yes. Um, Pessimistic personality can predispose you to being depressed. Uh, physical conditions, uh, and then uh, social, cultural, and psychological. And certainly most of those are happening to us right now. Um, maybe a whole range of those things going on with us. Grief. Grief's a normal reaction to an abnormal event, a loss or life-changing event. Um, if you think about grief, it involves things like um, psychological aspects, behavioral aspects, social aspects, physical reactions to the loss of something or someone. 
And the thing is, most of the time when most of us think about grief, um, we think about it being involved with death. Mm -hmm. But grief really occurs when we have any kind of a loss at all mm -hmm. um, in our daily lives that ties to how we feel about ourselves. Um, and guilt uh, or grief reactions may be seen in response to physical or tangible loss, uh, symbolic or psychosocial or physical conditions. Um, if you're laid off from work right now, that's a loss because it's a loss not only of the income and what you do, but the sense of how you feel about yourself yes. and what happens to you in your world. And so because of restrictions on our activities and our movements, um, we can feel a sense of, uh, of grief. Um, if we look at fear and anxiety in sort of a combination, um, fear about coronavirus has gripped the world. Uh, now, this new illness is frightening and needs attention. But it's important to note that many people die from an illness that's all too familiar, seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. So why are we so afraid of this novel virus um, when we're also just as likely to catch the flu? And I, there are several different reasons that researchers have looked at in terms of this. Um, think back. West Nile, 1999, SARS in 2003, I had to cancel a conference, Ebola in 2014, uh, Zika virus in 2015. Those are all different kinds of viruses, but they act on the same anxiety that are acting on all of us right now. Um, a word of a new disease, unfortunately, spreads quicker than the disease does most of the time. Right. Um, Fear can also drive our misconceptions. Um, memories of those pandemics come to mind for people. I mentioned the conference. Um, the scarier the experience that we have, the more we, deeply we put it in our memory. Um, cognitive researchers call that uh, availability heuristic or flashbulb memory. Let me give you an example. If I ask you where you were on 9-11, you and probably everybody else listening to this can describe in a lot of detail exactly where you were because that incident had such an impact on us that it influences us. Following September 11th, 20, 2001, research showed that feeling fear led people to believe that certain anxiety provoking possibilities were more likely to occur. That is, our emotions bias our decisions in ways that don't accurately reflect how dangerous something. It's sort of like, I'm afraid of something. I'm either going to run away from it or try to fight it, but I don't understand it completely. And so it has a bigger impact on how I make decisions. And that leads us to the next thing. Medical doctors and psychologists agree that human beings are wired to fear the unknown more than the evils, if you will, that we face every single day. Psychologist Paul Slovak of the University of Oregon says epidemics such as SARS and the, and the current coronavirus hit all of our hot buttons that trigger irrational fear in us, even if we're not around ground zero or with a high incident level because it can be fatal. It's invisible. It's hard to protect against. Exposure is involuntary. We don't make decisions. And it's not clear what people are going to be doing, how things are going to get controlled. Um, and so um, Dr. Slovak in a recent report, the American Psychological Association says it's that unknown piece that really gets us going and gets us sanction. Um, it turns out that we instinctively um, worry more about new risks than familiar ones. We also worry more about risks over which we don't have any control. Mm -hmm. And when a risk is new and we don't understand that risk, that lack of knowledge leaves us feeling powerless, helpless. That can add to anxiety, can also add to depression. Not knowing, which is always the case with new risk, 
leads to more fear. So what you do is you just get fear stacked on top of fear, stacked on top of fear. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the aspects. Another aspect, um, Dr. Barkar Fishoff on APA Speaking of Psychology website is an experience on public perception of risk, human judgment, and decision making. And he said the major difference between seasonal flu and the coronavirus or other pandemics is that we understand seasonal flu so well. We know people get it, a lot of people get it, people die from it, but we're so used to it because it happens every season. We go and get a shot for it. Maybe that's gonna take care of it. Some years we know it does, and some years we get told uh, this one didn't work, this shot didn't work as well. But we understand it. With coronavirus, we don't know where it's going, how transmittable the disease is, especially if you don't have any symptoms, um, and how effective the things that we're doing right now in terms of mental health issues are gonna impact our lives. And so for that reason, it simply makes it a lot more scary for us. Um, and then there's, excuse me, your profession, the media. Um, what happens with media coverage? When media coverage of new global health threat causes distress and anxiety, um, we may be able to handle that if the coverage is fairly limited. But when an outbreak is small, it doesn't get a lot of coverage. But have something happen or have like we've had where people, a lot of people at a single location, a nursing home for example, get it. And what happens is that gets a lot more coverage. Well, it's interesting because there was a study done um, in 2017 that looked at um, what happens in that kind of situation. And one of the things they found that is that if media coverage gets too uh, sensationalistic, what happens is it becomes sound bites. And so the context gets dropped out and that tends to make people more panicky. Uh, that was in a report by Dr. Ashmed Alad, who is a senior um, scholar at John Hopkins University for Health Sciences in Baltimore. That 2017 study I mentioned was in clinical psychological research and looked at the 2014 Ebola outbreak. And what they found was increasing hours of Ebola-related media exposure, i.e. the more you watch TV by a person, the more likely you are to have significant distress uh, associated with that, decreases the person's ability to handle social and work activities, and even several years later. By the way, a similar thing was found when we looked at um, uh, reactions uh, after Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. the same kind of thing. The more you watch the TV, the more and the longer it was going to take you to get over it. Um, other things, um, increased symptoms uh, for people who have a history of trauma or depression or anxiety or other mental health problems. Um, they're more vulnerable to stressful events. I think most of us know about the possibility of people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, um, having flashbacks. Mm -hmm. So one aspect of the current situation may relate to people who are quarantined. Uh, the journal uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases studied people who were quarantined during the SARS e epidemic, and they found many had psychological distress, and the most frequent disorders were depression and PTSD. Um, now that is a little different than what we have because in SARS, most of those folks were in single isolation, in a single isolation bed. Our quarantine, if you will, even if it's the self-quarantine, is a little different because we have people to interact. But that study and another study did show that uh, you're more likely to have after effects if you've had a, a past trauma in your life. So, what do we do now about all this? Um, a couple of tips. Um, try to keep things in perspective. Um, get the facts, hopefully from a credible source that you can trust. Um, communicate with your children. Um, age appropriate kind of 
comments, but communicate with them. Um, keep connected with your friends and family by phone or email because again we know that there can be problems uh, with that. Uh, share useful information from governmental websites with a lot of your friends and things. And probably the most important one, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, some of the things that have been posted, uh, um, bubble wrap. Don't pop bubble wrap because you could get the virus. No. Uh, you know, uh, ideas that like that. Um, I could go on for an hour about those, and maybe we will at some other point in time, but they're all out there, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of them too. <laughs> um, places to go. Um, CDC has a website, really tough to find. CDC.gov, <laughs> okay. Uh, go to coronavirus on there and you're going to find it. American Psychiatric Association, uh, you're going to find under psychiatry.org and look at their newsrooms, news release. Uh, that's got current information. American Psychological Association website is apa.org uh, under Psychology Help Center. Um, social workers, um, socialworkers.org is their website and again you're going to find them uh, under their news page, so there's things there. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're in the midst of setting up is um, the Akula Foundation will be using what's usually our grief support group referral phone number as a call in line to help uh, you find resources for information. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's going to be available. I think Dr. Arshad is going to talk a little bit more about that. But I want to mention the number here. Sure. Um, the number is 504-418-0791, okay? Uh, so I repeat, 504-418-0791. Uh, now, if you know a little bit about psychological teaching, all right, uh, you want to see one, do one, and teach one, so I'm going to teach one more, which the phone number is 418-0791, or look on our website, and that's at Akula Foundation. Dot com. That's A-K-U-L-A foundation dot com as we move ahead with this. So, well, um, Dr. Matthews, yeah. you know, didn't want to interrupt because all, all of the information so val valuable and uh, valid um, for what we're going through. One question, when people are dealing with grief, uh, going back to that, I know that traditionally there are several types of levels of grief. Yeah. Uh, we've maybe got some new levels in this particular instance because we're experiencing the loss of people that we may not get to see. Yeah. Uh, we may not get to grieve. We may not get to attend and funeralize them. What is, you know, your advice for people? Yeah, and, and and the situation in, like that, if you have um, grief where because of circumstances you can't go through uh, a normal process, and we're talking about a loss, but, sure. you know, you, uh, kiddingly, um, a friend of mine says grief is, is losing anything, all right? Um, uh, I've lost the, the, the keys to my car. I can't find them. If I'm a southerner from the mail, uh, it's either my hound dog or my pickup truck. Uh, it's it's some kind of loss that we have to deal with. And dealing with grief involves going through a whole set of steps in terms of stages of dealing with that, uh, with that grief experience to get over it. And so one of the things that's going to happen now is that we're going to have a situation where people are going to have to put off things that they would go through, um, especially um, if it is a death, because there are rituals that we have as cultures that we want to follow. And not being able to do some of those or having some of those postponed. Um, mm -hmm. I have a friend who just recently was supposed to go um, to um, a, uh, uh, an event with uh, one of his distant relatives in North Carolina uh, and couldn't go uh, because of the restriction and because of his health problems. And so we have to learn to deal with that. And as we go forward, we're, we'll be talking more about that and what we can do to kind of help that situation. Well, and I would believe as well that to internalize everything that we are uh, is not the place to stop okay. because you obviously need to speak to someone, which is why you shared the number right. that somebody can talk to. And I, I will tell you about that. Um, um, putting a lid on it to use a highly technical term and description is like
putting a lid on a pressure cooker and locking the valve down because sooner or later it's going to blow. Yes. So you need to deal with those things. You need to get them out. You need to talk to people. Yes. Um, it's, it's harder to do that now, especially if you're communicating and working a lot in the, in the family. Uh, but do that. Look at those kinds of things and put, I believe it's your phrase, a focus on community, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you uh, for your time, your information. I'm sure that we will revisit you again as we move forward. But everyone, uh, Dr. Lee H. Matthews has uh, presented us very well. He is a neuropsychologist and clinical psychologist giving us great advice, great tips of information we can hold on to as we all continue to navigate through this uh, very unknown and uh, uncharted area. But thank you again for your time, doctor. And we want to say again that that hotline number is 504-411. 180791 and it will be available on the screen uh, throughout this broadcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. You're welcome. We're continuing with our Focus podcast and now we are joined by Dr. Muhammad K. Arshad who is a board certified psychiatrist practicing psychiatry in New Orleans uh, over the last 30 years. He will share very valuable information as we look at our surroundings and how people are affected uh, psychologically as well as the, those that have mental illness uh, in our city. So doctor, we know that we uh, have a population of people who live on the outside, but we also know that we have patients who already are seeing, uh, seeking help and getting assistance uh, on a regular basis. And now we have something like this virus that comes into their life. So what is that impact like? Yes, uh, that's the tragedy of time that everybody nowadays talking about the quote unquote normal people who are going through the anxiety, the fear, the insecurity they are going through, fear of unknown anxiety. But we are losing the sight of millions of people in this country who already suffer from the mental illness. I can easily think about uh, the schizophrenic whose uh, uh, coping skills are uh, not too strong to start with and they're getting more mentally ill people don't cope with the things that well and they say mass hysteria we are going through is disarming them more and the schizophrenic uh, who's a paranoid and must mistrustful of the other people to start with getting more paranoid getting more delusional about the other people people thinking that they're trying to do something themselves and are getting more detached from reality and getting more isolated those are the patients I can think of who can uh, get, who could benefit from more attention from the society nowadays, from the providers. They might have a fear that they might lose contact with their provider, with their loved ones, people who are there to give them the medications, give them the support, take them to the doctor. They are so busy dealing with their own problem that they're not available for them. Our people who are manic depressive, sometimes the stress itself, it's not just the situational and the stress of the surrounding that you're going through. Sometimes, even at a chemical level, I can think of this fear and the, and the fight and flight that can raise our cortisol and the adrenal levels, and that in turn can throw the patient's system out of, out of balance, and they can decompensate in their illness. A manic depressive person, easily under the influence of the stress around us, slipping into the manic phase or getting more deep into depression and needing the adjustment in the medication. Or the person who has a baseline anxiety illness. I was thinking about this when I was coming here that there's so many symptoms, initial symptoms of coronavirus illness mimic the anxiety illness. That yes. The shortness of breath, the chest tightness, yes. the palpitation. In the beginning it looks like you're going through the anxiety or person getting just fearful that maybe they're catching corona when they're really having exacerbation of their anxiety illness and the panic symptoms and panic disorder. Or a person who's already depressed, getting more detached, more isolated, losing contact with their loved ones, with their sport ones, they might uh, have lost their job or at the, at the risk of losing their job or financial security, getting more depressed, getting more hopeless, helpless, feeling worthless and even getting suicidal under the stress uh, uh, what's going on around us, getting self-destructive. Or uh, the person who has a obsessive compulsive illness, who is already fearful of catching germs and the catching illness from the other people, mm. where everybody around us is, is fearful of that. Yes. They're getting so obsessed and uh, 
with, with the fear of the junk that they totally get uh, incapacitated and overwhelmed by their symptoms. So some of these uh, things we have to be aware of, that they might have a fear of losing their provider, losing contact with their counselor, their case manager, their social worker, not being able to make it to the mental health clinic to get their medication, or something, or their doctors closing their offices. Mm. So that's where uh, this comes in, are they getting out of them, running out of medication. Some of the specific things which I can think of they could do is a kind of establishing a contact and checking with the doctor's office whether it's still open or not. A yeah. lot of the doctors are nowadays seeing the patients remotely yeah. through the telephone, through the video talks. In fact, I had rounds with my patients this morning yeah. from home today. So they were appreciated that they have someone to look after them or adjust their medication and they begin to decompensate. And and also losing the contact with the loved ones, like I talked about, the family members who are there to attend to them. They're so busy dealing with their own ailments. Or everybody's busy talking about the physical part of this thing. People ending up in the ICUs. Are they not having enough ventilators? Mm -hmm. Who is going to attend to the mentally ill when they decompensate? Yes, very startling to say the least because there are so many areas that even those who don't have the normal access that we have every day, they still have uh, an out of reach uh, situation Yes, that they have to contend day. with. That's correct. So that's where we have to be conscious of that. In fact, it will be therapeutic for the family members to take the focus away from them and attend to their loved one. That right. can be a therapeutic outlet for them and a pretty cathartic sometime. Yes. Well, I, I would imagine when someone uh, knows that they need to reach out and let's say their family members are aware where they are, but you know, they're, they're getting their care uh, from their circle of, yes. of life. What is the advice you give to family members who are concerned about their loved ones and they want to try to offer some type of help? They may not respond to their family. They may really be having a, a breakdown. Um, what is the best advice someone can do to see that their loved one is at least getting some type of attention. That's where they're checking on on their regular basis. There are no alternative than the staying in touch with them, either through the telephone or video chats, or even talking to the people who live. Or if you cannot go and physically attend to them, you can talk to their neighbors, or have some kind of video conference with their caretakers. I have some of the patients who are on the home health care and the nurses have not been able to visit them. That's where they come in to be a resource to help their family members, or checking on their medications. A lot yes. of mentally ill people lose track of their medications. Mm -hmm. They might be fearful they're going to run out of the medication. Pharmacy is going to close, stores are closing. Mm -hmm. So that's where I feel that sometimes having a backup, having a little more medication as a backup, or some of the doctors and the pharmacies nowadays are filling up three months prescriptions where you could have a backup in case of crisis if, you, uh, if uh, your psychiatrist is not available. Yes, I, I appreciate that because uh, that is such a connection to maintaining some type of um, normalness, you know, within this uh, unstable situation that they're already a, a part of. So yes. at least that continues uh, something that they're familiar with, that yes. they can depend on. Yes. And I think that is really important, as you said. And so for those that are, we know we have our population that, uh, it, that lives outside, how can we um, help? Because we know that that's a population of people who don't live indoors. Staying connected, mm -hmm. staying educated, staying informed. And also I'm thinking that they, mentally ill people are more sensitive to the outside stress like talk about watching the news, watching them. They can easily cross the line where they're spending 24 hours watching the news. It becomes how, about how a lot larger. How many more deaths we are seeing, yes. where the lockdowns are coming in in every state, that kind of stuff you have mm -hmm. to be aware of. Yes, and I would imagine because of their uh, circumstance, some things, like you said, can unravel and really become larger than life and, and go way beyond some of the already problems that they have to yes. deal with. They yes. can really expand. Yes. And that has to be terrifying. And yeah. so we all are dealing with so many different new terminologies and new understandings about what is happening because it's really different for everyone. Yes. There's, and, no um, game. There's no master plan for this kind of thing. There's no yes. cookie cutter. A solution to this thing. Yes. There's no really play playbook written for this kind of crisis right. in our lives. 
we're just taking it one step at a time and, and utilizing the, the most recent information so that we can all stay on top of everything. But we absolutely appreciate you taking the time because uh, we need to know that everyone needs some mental health. Uh, at this yes. particular time, yes. we are almost all in the same group of needing to be able to reach out to someone, to touch someone, to know that we can be reassured that there is help and that we're not alone. And so we appreciate you, Dr. Yes. Muhammad Arshad. And so we want to also <laughs> once again remind everyone. Another thing I wanted to touch on, I, I just got a call from a friend when I was driving here. He is working from home and mm -hmm. he literally is falling apart with anxiety. Some of the people who are making the transition from going to work every day to staying at home, some of the tips for those people who deal with anxiety. Don't mix your personal space with the professional space. Mm. They get into the habit of not changing, calling and working on the computer in the underwears or pajamas. I would suggest that stick to the routine. Even if you have to get up and you have to put, put your work clothes on, you don't have to put the matchy tie, tie on or something like that, but have the workflows on. Mm -hmm. Have a separate place set in your home, a separate room or a separate area as a workplace. And don't mix your personal space with the professional space. And also have a start time and end time. We can easily get lost into this thing where you're working 24 hours a day. Yes. Oh, I forgot to do something. Let me check the computer at 7 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Have the start time and the finish time. Have a separate space and have a routine set. Don't break your routine. Yes, well, that's appreciated. Structure, very, very important yes. in all of this. Yes. And that's yes. going to really do a lot for a lot of yes. people to maintain the normalness, the new normal yes. that new you're normal. dealing with. I mean, there's nothing normal. The no. normal, there's a new set standard for the normal, as you know. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, once again, everyone, uh, Dr. Muhammad Arshad, and we are sharing the hotline. If you know someone or you yourself need information, need someone to speak to, to reach out to, the number 504 Four one eight zero seven nine one. That is a hotline available through to you through the Akula Foundation. Uh, and, dot and we're trying to make it twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. We okay. are going to have professionals. You're not going to get a prescription in the mail after talking to the psychiatrist, but they are going to give you some general principle guidance, the resources, and gear toward the to you to the right direction. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. And once again, we are joined with Dr. Akula, who is uh, practicing in infectious disease, uh, a graduate from Osmania Medical College and Osmania University in 1979, Infectious Disease Fellowship. He studied with uh, Stanford and Tulane University and completed his residency at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois, and is board certified in internal medicine. Dr. Akula, such a pleasure to have you back, and we continue talking about coronavirus. Yes, this is the right topic. Yes. And the right time. Yes. And mm -hmm. I would like to follow up on a couple of questions that uh, came up, especially in terms of the prevention. So I want to actually divide this uh, talk into like um, prevention and the treatment. So the prevention in general is very expensive, a lot expensive right now with social distancing, people not working, restaurants closed, businesses is closed, states shut down, countries shut down like in Italy. It is wrecking big havoc and these are all people are trying to cooperate with these measures, draconian measures and they impact our economy. We're almost close to a depression. I hope it's not going to happen. And so I would like to focus upon the prevention that all of us are doing in, in some way or in some fashion and some of us are overdoing. So I'm going to go about that and also talk uh, briefly about the treatment part. In terms of the prevention, uh, last time we talked about uh, People walk around the masks mm -hmm. and the uh, CDC does not recommend using masks for people to walk around. It's only recommended for people that are caring for COVID-19 patients or potentially suspected of COVID-19. Or if you have a patient that's coughing, has some upper respiratory tract infection, that you may want to put a mask on that person. Other than that, you know, people are overusing it. So I brought in a couple of, uh, two or three pairs of uh, 
mask and then show them exactly how it needs to be used because I was really surprised on the you know, street that I've seen some people with N94 masks. Mm. N95 masks are supposed to be for the healthcare providers. Oh. Just like uh, in an air filter for the air condition, 95% of the air particles are filtered, so it is that effective. And that is usually recommended for healthcare workers that are caring for suspected or COVID-19 patients. So what uh, we need to do is, by the way, I think you know, I was uh, amazed that Target has uh, apologized that it was meant on a regular shelf for anybody to buy it and it didn't realize that it was more valuable for the healthcare workers so they actually stopped it oh. and they apologized for that. So there is going to be, already we have about 300,000 cases. Yes. And uh, this is going to multiply, hopefully double because there is a new test that's coming up in the United States where you can actually get your results in 45 minutes. And that's going to be available this week all over. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine that there is a wide prevalence. All the celebrities, archdiocese now evidently is uh, tested positive. Yes. And uh, you have Sean Payton tested positive. All those celebrities coming mm -hmm. up and saying, hey, I'm positive. So COVID-19 is amongst us and it's probably going to boom in numbers. And I don't know how, uh, I cannot predict the numbers. But globally, if these rapid tests are available, I think the numbers are going to be a lot more. So coming back to the preventive measures, uh, this is N95 mask. And uh, what you do is you actually put and there is a aluminum strip over here that you actually close it thereby there is a, a tight seal of the mask. So that is N95 mask. The regular ones also have sort of a aluminum thing so you actually put it like this tight and, uh, and make sure that you have as close to the face as possible covering the nose. You have another one it's uh, more freely available that's easy to put in and like this. And you have uh, the last one, if you have this kind, this is actually not only helpful in covering the nose, but also the eyes. So there's a, if there's a splash of uh, droplets of people uh, coughing, sneezing, then this would be a lot more helpful. So going through those uh, masks, let's uh, go back to the main important thing, and that is the hand washing. Hand washing is very, very, very important and it's very cheap. And all you need is a 20 seconds of hand washing with a soap. It doesn't need to be antibacterial soap. So it's very, very important that people don't need to go for a name brand or any soap. What it does is it sort of uh, does some chemical reaction with the particles and the pack particles get washed out. There's actually uh, several uh, presentations of the hand washing and how it affects in, in a more discreet. So I'm going to skip that and, and I'm sure some people have already seen that. And social distancing and I cannot really uh, thank the whole community and the country and the whole globe that you know, there's a lot of millions of people. I believe that there's an estimate of one point uh, some billion people under social distancing lockdown. So mm -hmm. that is a big sacrifice to fight COVID-19. So it is very, very important and I cannot really thank all the participants, you know, kids, uh, mothers, you know, fathers, grandparents. I just wanted to focus upon treatment as uh, a lot of people think that there's no treatment and it's invariable death, that that's not correct. There is 97% uh, of the patients that are affected with COVID-19 are still living and the 3% that died, that went to the hospital perhaps, there is a treatment that's being given, although FDA has not approved. So it's not an approved drug, but there are compassionate basis drugs, which I'm gonna talk briefly, because one of them is remdesivir. It's an intravenous um, antiviral medications that has been uh, 
uh, not approved but it is in the testing phase hopefully by April we would have some results of this uh, study so this would be the one of the important ones and so forth anecdotal uh, tests of uh, two or three patients have been very successful then the next most common one that a lot of people are talking about is chloroquine or the derivative of chloroquine which is hydroxychloroquine also called as plaquenil this is supposed plaquenil is supposed to be 40 percent less toxic than chloroquine and it is widely used in the current day hospitals so anybody that's potentially has got a COVID-19 they are getting plaquenil and uh, there's some questions as to some doctors and some other people trying to get plaquenil for their own prophylactic purposes and the CDC does not re uh, recommend for prophylaxis. Neither FDA has recommends for treatment but it is available as expanded access. And there are other medications that are being uh, talked about. One of them is Avigen from uh, uh, Japan. That there is a pharmacy in Japan that is also known to be successful in treating the symptoms. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to conclude by saying that you know, this will give us plenty of time for vaccine to be developed next few months. And also, uh, it's a very happy note that I would like to say that there are 50 different products that are being tested right now. So everybody's trying to find a treatment for that. So at the end, and I want to reassure that just because you have COVID-19, uh, it's not that you don't have a treatment. There is some treatment available and people are getting some symptomatic relief with this. And hopefully by the time we get the virus vaccine, then it will be a, a, a treatment of uh, the COVID-19 for good. Dr. Shiva Akula, thank you very much. And everyone, let me thank you for tuning in again to The Focus Podcast. I'm singing Lisa. It's been my pleasure to continue bringing you very important information concerning the coronavirus and all that is available for our benefit as we continue to navigate our way through this with vigilance and strength. The hotline number you heard, 504-418-0791. 504-418-0791 is also available in the description area below this podcast. We do encourage you to share this podcast with everyone who can use this valuable information. We can be found on Google, Stitcher, Spotify, Breaker, iTunes, and of course, AnchorFM.com. Share it with everyone. I'm singing Lisa. Until next time, stay focused.